For tonight, we have a special guest. Many of you are aware that's why, why you are here. And so let me take a moment to introduce him. He started in uh, politics, his political career as a consultant to Nathan uh, Sharansky in 1999. In 2004, he and Sharansky co-wrote the best-selling book, The Case for Democracy, The Power of Freedom to Overcome Tyranny and Terror. And in 2013, he began serving as Israel's ambassador to the United States. He is considered uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, closest advisor and strategic consultant. He is married with five children, and when he's not stateside, his home is in Jerusalem, Israel. And in our church's support of Israel and our love for the Jewish people, would you please give a warm welcome to our guest, Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer. Thank you for that very warm welcome on a very cold night. Somebody was saying that it was God's plan for you to have to be waiting outside on a cold night to go hear from the ambassador of Israel. So if it was a test, you all passed that test. And I appreciate you holding this night uh, to honor Israel. And I want to thank Pastor Hamrick and his wife, Terry, for bringing me into your very special uh, church. Um, and while the night may be very cold outside, the relationship between our two countries has never been warmer and has never been better. The United States of America is the backbone of support for Israel around the world. And the community, the remarkable community of devout Christians in the United States of America is the backbone of that backbone. So on behalf of nine million, nearly nine million citizens of Israel, thank you for standing with Israel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we live, as you know, in a world of darkness and a world of light. Well, in the Middle East, most people only see darkness, and for good reason. The Middle East over the last few years has collapsed. In my country, uh, somebody commented that the problem for Israel was that Moses stuttered. Because <laughs> he was supposed to lead us to Canada. <laughs> and he said, C -c 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 and they said, Canaan? And then all of a sudden they started moving. <laughs> Listen, I know a lot of people you may have heard think the key to peace is mutually agreed land swaps. Now, it's mutually agreed neighbor swaps. So we take Canada, you guys get Syria. <laughs> I understand you have some issues with Mexico. We'll take them. <laughs> you can choose anybody you want from the region. But we live in a region filled with tyranny and terror. We are the democracy that's really in the eye of this storm. And as these old regimes are collapsing, the forces of militant Islam are rushing into the void. Now, I use those words very specifically. Militant Islam. It's not militants 
Timothy McVeigh, you remember that Oklahoma City bomber? He's a militant. That was an act of terrorism. But he's not part of a global movement. And the problem is not Islam. Islam is a faith. And it has changed over time. And it gets interpreted differently in different times. And I say that in a church, and I say that as a Jew. Because if you ask Jews in the 11th century, would we like to live in Christian Germany or in Morocco, we would have chosen Morocco. If you ask Jews in the 15th century, would you like to live in Christian Spain or in Muslim Turkey, we would have chosen Turkey. And you ask us in the 19th century, would you rather live in Christian Poland or in Muslim Persia, we would have chosen Persia. But we're not in the 11th, the 15th, or the 19th century. We're in the 21st century. And the Christian world today is different. And we are respected in Christian nations around the world. But the situation for both Jews and Christians and non-Muslims in parts of the Muslim world is very dangerous. And today you have a battle that is raging in the Middle East between two fanatical forces. The forces of Sunni Islam and the forces of Shia Islam. The Shia, they're led by Iran and includes Hezbollah and the Houthis and Assad's regime and all sorts of Shia militias. And the Sunnis, those are groups like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Hamas. And it's hard sometimes to make sense of all these groups. So I'm going to try to make it easy for you. Some want to take us back to the 7th century. Others want to take us back to the 9th century. Maybe they'll get together and decide to take us back to the 8th century. But they are all vying to be king of a militant Islamic world. That's the battle between them. And in this world, there are no rights for women. This is a world where gays are hanged, where minorities are killed or persecuted, and where there are no place for Jews and for Christians. The Jews in the Middle East that lived there for many, many centuries, we were kicked out of many of the countries in the region when Israel was established. But for Christians, the last few years have been particularly difficult in the Middle East. One of the most un underreported stories is that there is a genocide against Christians in the Middle East. A century ago, the Middle East was 20% Christian. Today, it's less than 4% Christian. Christian communities are being decimated, ancient Christian communities. Christians have literally been decapitated for their faith, something that you don't think you would have seen since the Middle Ages. But they are in the Middle East. And there is only one country in the Middle East that has a larger Christian population today than it had 50 years ago. Only one. And that's the nation that I am privileged to represent. The state of Israel whose Christian community is five times as large as it was the year Israel was established in 1948. And it's important for me that all of you know that the greatest victims of this fanatical war between fanatical Shias and, fan and fanatical Sunni are Muslims themselves. They are the greatest victims. Muslims who do not accept their unforgiving and fanatic creed. They are the ones who can be murdered by the hundreds of thousands. Millions are turned into refugees. Now, it is hard for people that are following events in the Middle East to really appreciate that there's a religious war going on. 
it's hard particularly from, for secular thinkers to understand that. It's hard for them to wrap their minds around the idea that people are willing to kill and to be killed for their faith. It's hard for secular people to do that. Devout people have an easier time understanding people who are so committed to their faith. But it's also us, it's hard for us, devout people who live in democratic societies to understand that there can be people like that who would fight religious wars and kill one another because we haven't seen such a war since the 17th century. And in the 17th century in Europe, Catholics were still killing Protestants. Protestants were still killing Catholics, and they were killing them in mass. Now there's a difference between what was happening in the 16th and the 17th century in Europe and what's happening in the Middle East. Because then, those religious wars were being fought with swords and muskets and an occasional cannon. And now they fight them with Kalachnikov rifles, with rockets and missiles, with chemical weapons, and the worst danger of all, nuclear weapons. Potentially fighting, I should say, with nuclear weapons. The greatest danger facing our world, by far, is the marriage of this fanaticism with nuclear weapons. The greatest danger by far. That is why the state of Israel opposed so fervently the nuclear deal with Iran. Now, had there been a deal that would have prevented Iran from developing nuclear weapons, I would have gone house to house and church to church to ask people to support it. But the reason the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, my Prime Minister Netanyahu, came to the American Congress to speak against the deal is because that deal paved Iran's path to a bomb. And I could not be prouder than the day the Prime Minister of Israel showed up to make that speech in the American Congress. And Israel is deeply, deeply grateful to President Trump for the decision to withdraw America from that nuclear deal and restore sanctions against Iran. <laughs> Never has there been a more important decision that an American president has made for the security of my country, Israel, than the decision that President Trump made to withdraw from that terrible nuclear deal. There is a regime that was getting tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars that were pouring into its coffers, a regime that openly vows to destroy Israel, that actively works to destroy Israel. You may have seen a couple days ago Three days ago, we marked International Holocaust Day on Sunday, where we remember the murder of six million Jews and the attempt to murder all the Jews. And a lot of governments made a lot of strong statements about that. But some of those same governments in Europe are working against President Trump to try to enable Iran to continue to get money to bypass American sanctions. This is a regime that openly calls for the annihilation of the one and only Jewish state. And European leaders want to protect an agreement with them that gives that regime hundreds of billions of dollars to achieve that goal and that ultimately paves a path to nuclear weapons. They should be ashamed of themselves. And thank God, that President Trump took that stand and took America out of that terrible nuclear deal with Iran. Now, even without nuclear weapons, the forces of fanaticism 
are marching on a campaign of conquest and tyranny throughout the region. You see it in Lebanon, you see it in Syria, you see it in Yemen, you see it in Sinai, you see it in Gaza, you see terror attacks throughout the Middle East, you see them in Africa, you see them in South America. But I want to tell you something, that amidst all this darkness, there is a great force of light. A force that is growing stronger and brighter. And that is the light of Israel. Now that light was lit again in 1948, a little over 70 years ago, when the Jewish people restored our sovereignty in our ancestral homeland. Now, it's pretty remarkable when the Jews are a sovereign people again, because it's pretty rare in our history. We're a people, I'm going to ask a question, even though we're a big group. How old is the Jewish people? Anyone know? How old? We're an old people. Not 10,000. Not 6,000. This is Price is Right. You know, you're a little bit older. How old? Somebody. Well, who's the first Jew? Abraham. How long ago was that? I heard it somewhere out there. We got to get an extra session here or something. We're going to do that. Again. This is only single jeopardy. We're going to. The Jewish people are about 3,800 years old. In that period, how many years have the Jews been a sovereign people? Well, let's go back to the first period of Jewish sovereignty. You may have read about it. It's in a little book called the Bible. It is still legal in this country to have a Bible, right? Yeah, good. So pull out your next to that bedside. They all have Bibles next to their bedside, Pastor. I know. You don't just have to go to a hotel to get an extra bedside. And you will read about the first period of sovereignty. You will read about Joshua crossing the Jordan. You will read about in the book of Judges. Then you will read about the kings of Israel. Who's the first king of Israel? Good. David would be the wrong answer. Saul is the right answer. Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then more kings of Israel. Then after Solomon, it breaks up between a kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And then the Assyrians come in and they destroy the northern kingdom and they exile the ten tribes of Israel, the lost tribe. Then the Assyrians come down to Jerusalem and Isaiah stands on those walls and tells them that their arrows will not pierce this city. And the kingdom of Judah survives for another 150 years until Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon Iraqis were causing problems back then, too. <laughs> he comes in, he conquers Jerusalem, and he destroys the first temple. From Joshua to Nebuchadnezzar. It's about seven or eight centuries. That's the first period of Jewish sovereignty. The second period of sovereignty would take centuries to come and restore again. After Nebuchadnezzar, there was a Persian king, Cyrus who allowed the Jews to go rebuild the second temple, but we were not a sovereign people. We had religious freedom to build our temple and to worship, but we did not have political sovereignty. That came about because a father and five sons defied a powerful Syrian Greek empire and rose up and won our freedom. And that is celebrated when you celebrate Christmas your Jewish neighbors celebrate Hanukkah, which is the story of the restoration of Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel in the second century BC. And that period of sovereignty lasted about a century. And in 63 BC, Pompey, before he did the miniseries on HBO, <laughs> he came and they placed a garrison in Jerusalem. And Israel, kingdom of Judah, we became a vassal of Rome. And we revolted against that, 
And eventually one of those revolts was put down in the year 70, and our temple was destroyed. That's the second period of sovereignty. It lasted about 100 years. And the Jewish people would have to wait 2,000 years to see our sovereignty restored again in 1948. So out of that 3,800 year history of ours, for only about a quarter of that time, we have been a sovereign nation. That is why the rekindling of that spark of sovereignty is in my mind the greatest miracle of modern times. The rebirth of the state of Israel. To take a people left for dead in the wake of the Holocaust. You know, sometimes you hear that the Holocaust created the state of Israel. Now, the reason why there was a Holocaust is that there was no state of Israel. It's not that the Holocaust created Israel, it's that, that we didn't have an Israel is why we had a Holocaust. We had no ability to defend ourselves, to let Jews fleeing this fanaticism come in to a country. We were a people left for dead, we were powerless, we were stateless, we were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And that spark was lit. And that flame got stronger and stronger as we brought Jews, like it talks about in the prophecies. The ancient prophets of Israel that we will be scattered throughout the world and we will come back to our land. And Jews came back from the killing fields of Europe. We came back from the Middle East and North Africa. We were airlifted, our Ethiopian Jewish brothers were airlifted to the country. And then when the Iron Curtain collapsed, a million Jews came from the former Soviet Union. And today, that flame is stronger and brighter than ever. As Israel continues to transform this desert into an oasis and a modern miracle. Few, uh, last year, a few months ago, they had a ranking for the most powerful countries in the world. Today, Israel ranks eighth. There's the five permanent members of the Security Council, United States and Russia and China and Britain and France. There's Japan, there's Germany, and then there's Israel. Nine million people, all the size of New Jersey, the eighth most powerful country in the world. Next month, Israel is going to be the third country to send a ship, I guess, or a lunar module to send that to the moon. That's it. The United States. Russia, China, and Israel, the only countries that have been able to do that. We are a powerful military power in the most dangerous region on, on Earth. And we are blessed to have had the long-standing support of the United States, which gives us the tools that we need to defend ourselves. We never ask the United States, any American soldier, to shed blood to defend the state of Israel. One of the great transformations that occurred in the life of the Jewish people is that for the first time in 2,000 years, we have the ability to defend ourselves. And we do, with great support and assistance by the United States giving us the tools we need to defend ourselves with some of the best anti-missile systems in the world that now we are selling and giving to your own military to protect your soldiers with one of the finest intelligence services in the world that in the last few years has prevented two dozen major terrorist attacks around the world because of the intelligence that you receive from Israel which keeps Americans and other peoples safe. And we have become a global technological power in agriculture, in water, in cyber. Israel is all of one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. But in cyber, we account for 20% of global investment in cyber. 
20% of private global investment is in Israel. That means Israel's punching 200 times above our weight. 200 times above our weight. And you see the light in how this remarkable technology is transforming the world. You see that in a pill that was designed in Israel with a camera in it that allows doctors to look at the insides of someone in order to perform the proper medical procedures. You see it in Waze. Anyone here take Waze? I think they know where the church, I hope they know where the church is. It's an Israeli technology that's literally helping people get to where they need to go. The technology is helping quench the world's thirst and feed its poor. And in science and medicine, we are pushing the boundaries to find cures for Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. And those of you who were reading the news, yesterday the report from Israel is that we might have found in Israel the cure for cancer. So it's quite a light, and it's glowing very bright. And the good news is this light stands unequivocally and unabashedly with the United States of America. And as America holds that torch of liberty in the darkness for everyone around the world, we hold up that torch in the Middle East. And I'm here tonight to ask you to help protect that light. The first thing you can do is stand with Israel to confront all the lies that are put out day after day after day. To stand with Israel against the lies that we are an aggressor, that our military that we are war criminals when we as a state take action that no country ever has taken to protect the innocents among our enemies. And to stand with Israel against the biggest lie of all, the lie that Israel is a foreign occupier in our homeland. We are called Jews because we are the people of Judea. Our name tells you that it's our land. We are the Jews because we are the people of Judea. This is the land where the patriarchs of the Jewish people prayed. It's where our prophets preached. It's where our kings ruled. And we are not occupiers in our promised land. When the Jewish people go to Israel, we come home. And we have come home to rebuild our ancient capital, our undivided and eternal capital, Jerusalem. And I want to thank President Donald Trump for making the historic decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to move the American embassy there. Tonight I mentioned Cyrus. I don't know if the Persians remember Cyrus, but the Jews remember Cyrus. The Jewish people will never forget the decision of President Trump to recognize Jerusalem as our capital. It will be remembered for all time, for generations and generations to come. So I ask you to stand up to the lies, and in particular, stand up to the nefarious movement that is called 
the movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. The BDS movement. It's an anti-Semitic movement that seeks to single out Israel, alone among nations of the world, to boycott, divest, and sanction. This great force for good and force for light is being challenged by people of darkness. And the reason why I ask you to do it is because of our unique history. In the 11th century, the 15th century, the 19th century, the relationship between the Christian and Jewish world was very different. It was marked by enmity, by hostility. And in the years since, particularly in the last decade, with Knights to Honor Israel like this throughout America, we have transformed that relationship into a friendship. Now I believe we have to go even deeper and build a deep partnership to defend our common civilization. And I believe that it's the Christian communities who should lead this struggle against this modern anti-Semitism. To stand with the Jewish people and the Jewish state and to push this darkness back. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do, you got to have an ask in the church, right, Pastor? The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is strengthen your Christian identity. I bet you didn't think you were going to hear the Jewish ambassador of Israel tell you to go to church. <laughs> but you need to go to church because I believe the greatest threat to Israel is a world that no longer believes in right and wrong, that no longer believes in truth and falsehood. A world where everything is narrative. Truth is always somewhere in the middle, right? You hear that? Well, there are people who think six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust, and there's people who deny the Holocaust, so maybe the truth is three million. No, there is truth and there is falsehood. And we're living in a world where people think that justice and power are like buckets in a well. When one goes up, the other one goes down. And that's a very dangerous world to live in. One of the greatest contributions that the Jewish people made to the world, to our civilization, is we taught the world that might does not make right. It doesn't matter that the pharaoh, <coughs> excuse me, is the pharaoh. We have a higher law. The prophet Jacob, Nathan, excuse me, tells King David, when he says, you were that man, he rebukes the king of Israel. The prophets of Israel rebuke the kings of Israel because might does not make right. And every empire that has tried throughout our history to wipe us out, we never were willing to say that might makes right. But ladies and gentlemen, might does not make wrong either. You can be powerful and just like this country has been you can be powerful and unjust. You can be weak and just, and you can be weak and unjust. And we have to push back against the idea that power and justice are the same thing. They are not, they are two different things. And I believe that the stronger you teach right and wrong, the stronger you teach truth and, uh, truth and falsehood, the stronger your Christian identity is, the stronger will be your support for Israel. And finally, one of the best ways to fight the lies and to strengthen your Christian identity is to not just stand with Israel, but stand in Israel. 
How many of you have been to Israel? How many of you have not been to Israel? Well, you got a lot of trips to organize. We get about 200,000 Christians a year come to Israel to drop in a bucket. Every Christian around the world should come to the land of Israel. They should come to recharge their Christian identities. They should come to see the Bible come to life, to come to walk in the places where Jesus walked, and to come to learn the truth and to study the Word of God. You know, I hear today that, uh, is Kerry Summers here? Somebody told me he's here. Ah, there's Kerry. So definitely go to the Museum of, of the Bible, which is an hour away. But after you've done that a few times, go to the land of the Bible. And I think you will see the remarkable nation that we have become. This tree that has once again been planted in its ancient soil and whose branches grow higher year after year and produces fruits that is literally transforming the world. Ladies and gentlemen, rest assured that no matter what darkness surrounds us, Israel will continue to proudly carry that torch. And I know that as we do, that the United States of America will stand there right by our side. Thank you very much. You, you kept their attention better than I do, so thank you for, you've raised the bar for me. You gotta do it every well, week. Yeah, well. You know, once a year I can Actually keep. twice a week, but who's counting? But anyway, I. <laughs> I think you're counting. Okay? Yeah. Um, we've been friends for a long time, you and I, like 10 minutes before the service started. <laughs> but, but I have a gift for you. Your security detail has already checked this out, so go easy, gentlemen. But I wanted to give this to you, so you can go ahead and open it now. Actually, you can read the card later, but you can okay. open the gift card. Because I think this symbolizes what you've been talking about. I'm sure you don't have a menorah. <laughs> but this, um, this was actually a symbol that was, oh, the whole thing is... Falling apart, sorry about that. You know, I just saw, I don't know, did any of you see this bit on ESPN where they're all holding the trophies and the trophies fall up? So I didn't think that no, was going to No, well, uh, now I'm going to... Sorry. Anyway, back in the se first or second century, th this, this symbol was actually um, uncovered by archaeologists because it's, um, if, if you turn it this way, you can see the, the Christian symbol of the fish and the tail of the fish, do you see the, the fish right here? And the tail of the fish interlocking with the base of the menorah, and so you get the Star of David in the middle. And have you never seen one of these before? I've seen a few menorahs, yeah. But menorahs, but I mean this, this whole connection with Christianity. No, no but you well, know, it's, it's new. Something it's for your for shelf me. now. <laughs> Before you ask the question, I, I spoke a little bit about Hanukkah, about the miracle of Hanukkah and everything, but there was this family, the Maccabees. You can read about it in the book of Maccabees. It's not in, in the canon, in the Jewish canon. It's in the Apocrypha. We, don't, yeah, the, we don't have the book of Maccabees. The back of Maccabees. Oh, you don't have it either. No, no. So am I allowed to actually tell them through? Oh, you, I mean, because it's not in our Bible either. Yeah, right. It's so not it's in okay. Our we're both. Well, if you're Catholic, we're both equally going yeah. off the reservation. So. <laughs> If they're Catholic, they have it, we, we don't. So, right. But the interesting thing, what people don't know about that story, is that this family that rose up and led this whole revolt, those Jews were not fighting to save their lives. They were fighting to save their identity. Yeah. 
They actually risked their lives to save Judaism. And had Judaism not been saved in the second century BC, there would be no Christianity yeah. 150 years later. So not only do the Jews owe a debt of gratitude to those Maccabees, but Christians yeah. owe a debt of gratitude to the Maccabees. Yeah, so thank, thank you for giving me this, uh, this beautiful and almost put together in all. <laughs> I'm sure somebody in your detail has a, a screwdriver. In it's a little, it's a little big. It came from Israel, though. It, but this is not China. I this see. is Israel. It really is. <laughs> I promise you, I'm I, not. I'm a diplomat. They make wonderful products in China. I don't want to. Say <laughs> True. Um, friends, we only have a few minutes for Q and A, but if uh, if we could, can you all put that up on the screen for me? If you want to text in your question uh, to six two nine five three. Uh, and you have to start the text with the letter CC, skip a space, and text it to 62953, your question. While, while people are, are texting in those, I have a few, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. So how um, will the United States' withdrawal of our forces in Syria potentially impact Israel? Well, the issue with Syria for us is that we want to see Iran out of Syria. What Iran is trying to do is essentially to put a noose around Israel's neck. They already have part of that noose in Hezbollah, in Lebanon. And right next door, they're trying to establish permanent military bases in order to attack Israel. And we are determined to not let that happen. And the prime minister has said it clearly. And not only has he drawn his red lines, he has enforced his red lines. And Israel will continue whatever we have to do to prevent Iran from establishing that military presence in Syria. And what has happened is we have been succeeded with our policy by the military operations we've conducted, by the enormous economic pressures that are being brought to bear by the restoration of sanctions against Iran, and there was this American military presence that was there. So when the initial report came about the decision to withdraw, the first thing we think about is will this affect our ability to confront Iran? The President, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, they've all made clear that they are going to be very, very committed to confront Iran. They are leaving, for now, some forces in the South. There's a base there that's very important. Um, and I hope and I'm confident that even though the U.S. will withdraw those forces, that the commitment to confront Iran will not only be as strong as it was before, but I think it will be even stronger and maybe we'll have People will see more of that in the, uh, in the days and weeks ahead. But th this president and this administration has no problem distinguishing between, um, uh, in, our, in this region, the enemies and the friend. Yeah. Th they know that Iran is an enemy of Israel. They know that Iran is an enemy of the United States. And the president of the United States is determined to confront that. I think he tweets about it almost once a day. Uh, he does a few other tweets as well at the same time, but he tweets about that. But he is, he is really determined, and as I said before, this decision to withdraw from that nuclear deal, yeah. that's a very, very, very big deal. And that was a decision, and this is why I so much admire it, that his senior national security people at the time all opposed. So when you read about, well, all the national security people say it's the wrong decision, all right. So maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Secretary Marshall was the American Secretary of State in 1948. And he was a great war hero and a great individual who did the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after the war. But he walked into Truman's to Oval Office when President Truman was there, and he insisted that Truman not recognize the state of Israel when we were going to be established. And he said actually to Truman, if you recognize it, I won't even vote for you. But that simple, moral, decent man from Independence, Missouri, took him 11 minutes to recognize the newly established state of Israel and to become the first world leader to do it. So when President Trump makes a decision against many of the senior people in his administration and against the wishes of all those leaders around the world that marched into Washington to tell him not to do it. The French president came in and the German chancellor came in. Everyone said, don't do it. And he stood up to all that pressure and he did the right thing. And he did the right thing. And unfortunately, you know, one thing I've learned 
If you look about how the entire world did this agreement, all these sophisticated people, supposedly sophisticated people, did this agreement with this terrible regime in Iran, I've learned that you have to be very well educated to believe in very stupid things. <laughs> you know, normal... You have to go to a seminar at Harvard to understand why giving killers who hate you hundreds of billions of dollars is going to make you safer. Yeah. I haven't figured out. Yeah. Somehow, thankfully, President Trump didn't take that seminar at, ha seminar at Harvard yeah. and decided, you know what, we're going to actually take money away from the killers yeah. and use it to strengthen our security and Israel's security and make sure that we're confronting them. So as I said, thank God for that decision. No more important decision for the security of Israel than that decision that President Trump made. Yeah. Um, in regards to the land, so, you know, as Christians, we, we look at Genesis 15, 18, which talks about God's original covenant with Abraham from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river Euphrates in Iraq, a roughly 300,000 square mile territory, which Israel never really has possessed all of that kind of territory in general. But, but, and, but you have Arab nations around you with over 5 million square miles of territory. Israel now has roughly 8,100 square miles, give or take, only 8,100 and over 5 million square miles of Arab neighboring nations around you. So my question is, why do you think that the, the belief is that there will be peace if you give away more of your land. Takes very educated people to believe very <laughs> true. No, I, look, I, first of all, I, That's I, the position of the world in general. Just give up more land and there can be peace. It doesn't make sense to us, so... You know, we've learned so many that? times in history the fact that the whole world believes something doesn't make it right. Right. Uh, I hope we learn that uh, lesson from history. The whole world believed a lot of very bad ideas over time. but. Look, Israel uh, wants peace, strives for peace, and will always pursue peace. It's also in the Bible to pursue peace. And we, anytime we were faced with an Arab leader that truly wanted to make peace, we made peace. When Egypt produced an Anwar Sadat that decided to come to Jerusalem and to end the conflict between Egypt and Israel, Israel made peace, even though we we made a compromise for peace. We returned territory, the Sinai, and those of you who don't know, is three times the size of Israel, three times. And it also has oil yeah. there. And we returned it, yeah. gave it to Egypt in exchange for peace. And when we had uh, King Hussein in Jordan and he wanted to make peace, the late Prime Minister Rabin made peace with him. And when we have a leader, a Palestinian leader, uh, who will want to truly make peace with Israel, then no matter which Israeli government is there, we will seek to make peace. But we have to make a peace that is based on truth. A peace that is based on lies will never hold. Many people think when Israel asserts its right to the land, when you talk about the Bible, when you talk about that history, you are pushing peace further away. I totally disagree. It's only when our enemies understand and when the world understands that Israel is there by right, not just by might, right. but by right, can we ever truly have peace? The reason why we have not had peace for 70 years with the Palestinians is because they've never accepted the legitimacy of a nation state for the Jewish people, that's what a Jewish state means, in any bound. Once they accept that legitimacy, once they accept our right to be in this land, we will be able to achieve peace. If they don't, if they continue to say we stole their land, that we're foreign colonialists, and if that's what they teach their kids, you'll never be able to make an agreement. Because mm -hmm. even if somebody's saying you stole my house, you stole my house, you stole my house, you can offer 99% of it back. It won't matter. But if they say you're here by right, Mm -hmm. Now, they can say they're here by right, too. They can say, well, you know, we've lived in this land for centuries and we want to share this land with you. You're here by right and we're here by right. Even if they say it's 1% yours, it's 99% ours, you're in a negotiation. But when they say you're foreign occupiers right. in the land, when you say you stole our house, there's no chance of peace. And 
The other thing I'll say, final thing about peace, don't pay that much attention to what the peace envoy or the diplomats say. You want to know whether we're getting closer to peace? Turn on a television set and see what kids are watching. See if our Palestinian neighbors are teaching their kids to hate Jews, to deny any right of the Jews in that land, to say one of the things the Palestinian leader says is we are, the Jews are Judeifying Jerusalem. What does that mean? That's like saying the, you know, the Russians are Russifying Moscow <laughs> or the Chinesinifying Beijing. This is Jerusalem. Yeah. And they refuse to recognize any connection between the Jewish people and this land. Why? Because if they recognize our right to be there, the whole scaffolding of their rejection of Israel collapses. This is why the decision of President Trump to recognize Jerusalem as our capital and move the embassy is so important for peace because it punctures this lie. Mm -hmm. It says that the Jewish people are in Jerusalem by right. It recognizes that history. And when Palestinian leaders recognize that, when they educate Palestinian children to understand, hey, you know, that Jewish people, they have something to do with Judea. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. And there's never been a people with a connection to a land like the Jewish people's connection to the land of Israel. There's never a people who have come back Never. From expulsion. Most of the peoples that you read about in the Bible, they're gone. They don't exist anymore. The seven nations that were in the land of Israel. The Palestinians call themselves the Canaanites, but they're not the Canaanites. No. All of these nations, they disappeared. But we kept our faith. Yeah. And through all those years of exile, we turned in prayer three times a day, three times a day to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. When we circumcised, our children, we talk about Jerusalem. You ever been at a Jewish wedding? Hands up for if you've been at a Jewish wedding? A few. Well, you see, how many of you have seen Jewish wedding in a movie? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, you know they stand under the wedding canopy, and you know at the end they break a glass? Mm -hmm. Do you know why we break a glass? We break a glass because a wedding is considered our moment of greatest celebration and greatest joy. And we break that glass which we have been doing for 2,000 years to mourn the destruction of our temple in Jerusalem. That's why we break that glass. So if anyone on the planet thinks it's going to sever the link between the Jewish people and the Jewish land, they are kidding themselves. The Western Wall is not occupied Palestinian territory. Right. That is the, the cradle, the heart of the Jewish people and we are never going to be uprooted from our land again. Yep. Amen. I, want, I want to be sensitive to your time and also to everybody here, um, and so we, we're sadly It's not cold, it's warm in here. It's yeah, it is, outside. but, um, but I'm, maybe you can come back and answer questions another time too, but I've got a slew of questions that we're unfortunately not going to be able to get through. But let me, let me pose this one, and I don't, want you, I don't want to put you on the spot and have you enter the political fray with all the debate about the wall, but I'm getting questions. At least you can perhaps answer the question from the standpoint of Israel. Has a wall been effective in helping to protect your country? Do you think a wall itself is an immoral thing? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to wait into your debate. I will right. speak about Israel and, our, and, and specifically right. what it deals with. So in Israel, we have three different barriers. And sometimes people confuse them. We have a barrier between Gaza and uh, Israel. We have a barrier in Judea and Samaria, what the world always refers to as the West Bank. And most of that is built in Israel. And then we have a barrier on our southern border with Egypt. And that's the one most people are talking about. That's not actually a wall. It's a very, very long fence. And the fence has prevented people from simply walking in, thousands and thousands of people from walking in um, uh, to the country. And we were, have a few years ago, about 10 years ago, we had an exponentially increasing number of people who were simply walking into the country unimpeded across, through Africa, across the Sinai Desert, and into Israel. And once we built that fence, which is 
a fence in largely a desert, but with a lot of technology, so if somebody triggers it, you know, our, our forces will get there very fast. It has reduced, and I think this is what the president means when he, he refers to it sometimes, mm -hmm. it has reduced the issue of those illegal migrants that came in by 99.9 percent. That's true. We went from about one year, I think, 24,000, and the last year that it was measured, there were zero. So actually, that would be 100%, uh, yeah. zero. Yeah. So, I, I would love to, to believe that we could all live one day in a world where you wouldn't need any walls or any fences or anything else, but not just on our southern border, these other things that we've put in place are to protect our population from harm. In Gaza, we have people who openly call for the murder of Jews who live only a, you know, a couple miles away. And they say it. They say they're going to go through the fence and they're going to murder that Jewish community. And our soldiers have to hold that line. And if people were, and this is not the situation you have here with your southern border, because you're not dealing necessarily with terrorism or something, but some of those fences have been critical at maintaining our security. And we also had a situation with that third fence of, we had a situation 15 years ago when we had a wave of ter waves and waves of terrorism where people were strapping suicide explosive vests onto themselves and simply walking into populated areas. And when we put up that border, yeah. the numbers drastically, that fence drastically, drastically went down. So it saved lives. I will say that the issue of a fence and a wall within Israel is completely uncontroversial. This is something that unites Israelis across the spectrum because they want to make sure that they're, uh, they're safe. It is not a matter of an internal uh, political debate within Israel. I know it's a matter of internal debate here, so I don't want to weigh into it. But in Israel, our experience with that has been a very good one. Yeah. So someone asked, and, and I'll end with this before we have a closing song too, but... Um, I'm not going to sing it. No, you're not going to have to sing <laughs> You have... He cares about this congregation. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what are, what's some of the biggest challenges facing you as the Israeli ambassador, and how can we be praying for you? Well, look, the, the challenge for us is to continue to strengthen this remarkable alliance between uh, our two countries. It didn't always start that way. I mentioned Truman recognizing Israel, but when Truman recognized Israel, the United States had an arms embargo on a Jewish state at the time. And so while our enemies were getting weapons, we were not able to get weapons from the United States. We fought the, our War of Independence in 1948 with Czech rifles. We fought the 1967 war with French planes, not because the Czechs make better rifles or the French make better planes. It's because America wouldn't sell us those weapon systems. Then after we proved ourselves on the battlefield, after this remarkable, miraculous victory in 1967, the United States invested more in Israel and then saw us you know, as an ally that both shares its interests and shares its values in this Cold War battle when our enemies were being supported by the Soviets. And that changed the relationship. Today, Israel is in a different place in terms of its relationship with the United States. And I believe that Israel will be the single most important ally of the United States in the 21st century. The single most important ally. And I'm not saying that because we agree with President Trump on the nuclear deal with Iran or we appreciate his decision to move the embassy. No. It's because of two things. Security and technology. The greatest dangers facing the United States, unfortunately, are going to emanate from the Middle East for the foreseeable future. Now, one thing that unites people across your political spectrum is you're not looking to get involved in more wars in the Middle East. And to the extent that you're not looking to get involved, you need a solid, reliable ally in the region that can defend your interests and your values. And as I said, Israel does not ask America to fight for us. We will fight for ourselves, and in doing so, we are fighting for you. And therefore, that alliance will become more and more important over time, particularly because we have one of this great intelligence service that literally is spoiling terrorist attacks every day and saving American lives and other lives. And the second issue is technology. There are two great centers of innovation in the world. One of them is to the west, it's in Silicon Valley. The second is to the east, we call it Silicon Wadi. It's in Israel. 
This is where you have 40 of the 50 leading technology companies in the world have R&D facilities in Israel. This is where all these cyber innovations and autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence, all this technology and all these discoveries, even the cure for cancer, it's all happening in Israel. And when I look around the world and say, which country around the world will do the most to keep Americans safe and to keep Americans prosperous, to drive those technologies, to create, to find those discoveries and to create that better world? It's not Britain, it's not France, it's not Germany. It's that little country called Israel, that tiny country whose flame burns very, very bright. Yeah. And we pack a hell of a punch. <laughs> and we're gonna continue to pack it. I'm sorry for saying hell in a church. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I just thought about it now. Am I forgiven? I, I talk about heaven and hell here too. Uh, just in a different way. But yeah, no, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you for your apology though. But listen, friends, uh, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And God is watching over Israel. And Psalm 122 tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So um, I'd like to pray for the ambassador. I'd like to pray right now for Israel. If we could, so let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to have the ambassador with us. And we just pray over him and his family that you would bless him, that you would watch over him, that you would use him for your glory, that you would protect him. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem in accordance with your word, that you would glorify yourself through this nation, that you would be revealed in wonderful and spectacular ways. And we thank you that we as Christians appreciate and honor Israel because, Lord, he who blesses Israel will be blessed. And so we thank you that we can partner in prayer, praying for the Jewish people and for the state of Israel, for your blessing and protection over them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now before we go, before we go, we actually have our worship team has worked on a closing song as a tribute to Israel and um, in, in honor of your being with us, Ambassador Dermer. And so, but I need to give a little instruction. Uh, the worship team is going to come out now. They're going to get set up to play this closing song. It's a wonderful song. And I'm going to ask this. Please don't leave. And as soon as the song is done, I need you all to still remain seated. The ambassador has to exit the sanctuary first. So uh, after the song is over, Pastor Matt's going to come up and share a few closing announcements. So um, Most people think that's for security. It's so that I get to beat the traffic. <laughs> It is. But let's show our appreciation one last time. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat.
like strangers to the ends of the earth. I will send you a savior. I will finish my work. Thank the ambassador one more time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.